Outrageous pain can only be responded to through outrageous love. Outrageous love, love is a perception. Love is knowledge, love is gnosis. Martha Nussbaum correctly titled one of her books, Love is Knowledge, right? Love allows me to see, love allows me to know. And love allows me to perceive beauty. And beauty, both as the Hebrew wisdom interior sciences articulated it, and right as Whitehead correctly articulated it, beauty contains multitudes. Beauty contains contradictory values, right? And from that contradiction, paradox emerges and new synergy and new beauty arises. And it's such a good moment, my friends, right, to be together. And in this good moment, there's outrageous pain. And in this good moment, there's outrageous love. And in this good moment, there's outrageous beauty. And I want to just share for a moment what we mean when we say outrageous, because the word outrageous is part of the core structure of the new story of value rooted in first principles and first values that we are formulating, right, articulating and sharing right, as the primary response to existential and catastrophic risk, right, as we live in this moment of time between utopia and dystopia, right, as existential risk hovers in multiple vectors, and as we need to respond, we understand that although infrastructure responses are important and valid, and social structure changes of laws, et cetera, are important and valid, but those depend on superstructure. And this is a distinction from Marvin Harris, a, a Marxist theorist, right? But it's, it's Marxism complex, this distinction, excellent, right? Superstructure. And superstructure is the worldview right, that society is rooted in. Superstructure is the what we're calling the story of value that a society is rooted in. And what we've done is, is trace every major vector of existential and catastrophic risk to a breakdown in superstructure, meaning to a breakdown in the core story of value that animates society. So for example, when we looked at Me Too, with all of its beauty and its excesses. And when we look at masculine sexuality with its excesses and its, and its wild beauty, with its wild beauty and its excesses, which have expressed themselves for some men in sexual harassment. When we look at the acting out that takes place that causes feminine shadow and sexuality, right? Whatever the sexuality story is, if you look at the larger issues in culture, right, you realize when you look at date rape, right, on college campuses, both its actuality and the way it's been misreported, right, all of those issues are rooted in a fundamental breakdown in a story of value, which is we don't have a sexual narrative. That's just one example. We don't have a sexual narrative, right, that actually meets our sexual experience. And so therefore, the sexual experience causes enormous shame. And only by retelling a new sexual story can we address those issues. So for example, in the think tank, we've spent several years on a project that we've completed the core of. Now we're in the last year, year and a half of the, the final stages, and we've written a 16 volumes on a phenomenology of sexuality, an abridged phenomenology, a complete phenomenology, a, a one volume, then there'll be another probably 15 mini volumes We've actually written what we hope is the great work in this generation on Eros and Eros's relationship to, to love and to sexuality. Why? Because we had to retell the story. But that's not true about sexuality. It's true about economics, right? It's true about immigration policy, right? It's true about methods of governance, right? It's true about how technology is enacted, right? Technology was not merely a tool, but an environment. 
and how those environments of technology are enacted, all of those are dependent right, on a, a prior story of value. And how we live in that story of value is how we show up, right, in how we make policy, right, how we engage. You can't just change policy. It's not going to work, right? Policy generally is social structure, often infrastructure. Infrastructure, the structure of, you know, how things work, roads, technology environments are infrastructure. Healthcare programs, right, are right, their kind of structure in society are a mixture of infrastructure and social structure because social structure, because they're governed by, right, a set of laws, right? So social structure is kind of laws and contracts in society and infrastructure is the actual infrastructure, the actual kind of planetary stack, right, of society, how the actual infrastructure works, transportation and technology in all of its forms. What we're saying is you can't change it based on infrastructure and social structure. You need superstructure. And superstructure is, is, you know, we're saying this differently than Marvin Harris would have said it because he didn't actually understand the intrinsic nature of value. But we're, we're emerging out of his notion of superstructure and saying there's a story that we live in. And it's a story of value. And it's rooted in first principles and first values. And we have to retell that story. That's the story that's broken down. Does everyone get that? And pre-modern, pre-modernity had a story of value. Right, which was connected to each of the great religions, which each claimed that its value was exclusive. Pre-modernity breaks down. We realize all the religions are claiming mutual exclusivity. It doesn't make sense to us. Each one is saying that they've got the only source of value. And we go to modernity, right? and modernity rejects these claims of intrinsic value in many of its major expressions and begins the articulation of value being but a social construction. That was the major, not the only, but the major strain in modernity. And then that explodes in postmodernity, right, in which postmodernity argues for a complete deconstruction of all value. And for example, one popular historian parroting or echoing, you know, postmodernity says all value, right, is a figment of your imagination, a social construct, fiction. And that's where we are today. We are today at a moment in which, right, the very notion of intrinsic value has been fundamentally undermined and fundamentally questioned. And our own experience of value has been challenged, right, as being, right, but our own coincidental, random, and ultimately meaningless, in any ultimate sense, meaningless human projection, right, in a world in which ultimately it's a tale told by an idiot full of sounds and furies signifying nothing. That's the root cause. And if we don't go to root cause, right, if we don't go right back to source and actually reclaim a story of value in a post postmodern, right, a metamodern, post postmodern, right, integral, right, a kind of new story of value, which actually can be told and can be articulated and can be scaled and can be shared and can therefore reshape once it's shared education and can reshape commerce and can reshape economics and can reshape politics. That's the way it's always happened, right? When, when da Vinci and his cohorts were in Florence in the Renaissance and the black death, the pandemic had swept Europe, they understood that the only response they could do that would be effective was to tell a new story of value. And that's what, that's what the Renaissance did. The Renaissance was like today, right? A time between worlds and a time between stories. And what did da Vinci and his cohorts do? right, about a thousand of them, right, as I mentioned probably a thousand times here, that Paul Tillich has pointed out that there weren't more than a thousand people involved at the inner core of the Renaissance. So there was this band, right, that got together, and what did they do? They they made attempts at infrastructure, and they made social structure attempts, but at the core, they told a new story. They realized that the story of value that was pre-modernity, the traditional story of value had broken down, that we need to tell a new story, and they told a new story of value, which was modernity. Now, to the extent that that modernity adopted genuine core values and articulated them, it articulated and evolved the great dignities of modernity, feminism, universal human rights, third person gnosis, which which created science, possibilities for measurement, the move from classification in the Middle Ages to measurement. All of these created the great dignities of modernity. But to the extent that 
the deeper philosophical understanding of modernity claimed that value wasn't actually real. And it's even as modernity was articulating values, it was actually saying in the same breath, but we're making these up, right? These are not actually real. They couldn't find a way to root the values in cosmos once they were no longer rooted in a revealed scripture. That was modernity's a great collapse, and that exploded in postmodernity, which then formally, right, postmodernity was really modernity on steroids, right? It formally deconstructed all value, right, and created a world in which the leadership, the political leadership of the world in their core, from Putin and Xi Xi, right, in, in, in China, to much of, I'd say even most of American leadership, and American political leadership and, and European political leadership actually doesn't believe in intrinsic value, right? right? Either they don't believe in intrinsic value or they make a pre-modern regressive traditional move. The only value is right our particular version right of value in our particular religion right that we actually expressed right in pre-modernity, that's got to come back online. For example, the Catholic view of abortion right in America. Right, coming back online. So you can't actually understand reality without understanding the entire question is, are we living in a shared story of value? Now, I began with the words, outrageous love, outrageous pain, right? outrageous beauty. But we live in a world of outrageous beauty, but beauty is a value. Beauty is not nothing. Beauty is not just a beautiful man, a beautiful woman, right? a beautiful sunset, it's all of those. Right? And beauty comes in, you know, a beautiful old woman of 97 and a, a gorgeous, beautiful man's face who's 93 and you just see amazing beauty on their face. Right? Beauty comes in many shapes and forms, but beauty is something deeper as Alfred North Whitehead, right, talked about it. And as the Zohar, right, the 13th century Hebrew interior science document, right, talks about beauty. Beauty is the ability, and Whitehead writes about this in Venture and Ideas and in process and reality, the ability to contain. Beauty is the ability to contain oppositions, right? Beauty is the symmetry that happens right, when diverse threads come together and then something new is manifest. That's how Whitehead talks about beauty. Beauty is that which, as Whitman said, contains multitudes. And what synergizes from those multitudes is something new, which is unimaginably beautiful, right? And for Whitehead, beauty is the primary experience and goodness and truth are both expressions of beauty. And that's similarly true in the interior sciences of Hebrew wisdom. Tif Eret is the illumination of the divine and Tif Eret, T-I-F-E-R-E-T, Tif Eret means beauty. And Tiferet is the illumination of the divine, which is also called Shalom, which is usually translated as peace, but it means wholeness, wholeness, which is when diverse values, which oppose each other, come together and live together, right? And they synergize and they create a larger whole of stunning symmetry, which generates a whole greater than the sum of the, any, any of the parts. That's beauty. So Whitehead and the Tsar actually experience beauty in the same way. That's what beauty is. A beautiful person is not some plastic, superficial sense, right? It's this depth in which the entire person, interior and exterior, shines together, whether that's the beauty of a person or an idea, right? Or a landscape, right? Or right, a color that integrates different colors. So we live in a world of outrageous beauty. That's one. Two is we live in a world of outrageous pain. Outrageous pain is the opposite of outrageous beauty. Outrageous pain comes from this experience where I take one value, I reject other values. I take one experience, I reject other experiences. I take one insight, I reject other insights. And then I build my worldview based on that one value or that one insight. Right? I allow my value to stand. I decontextualize it from the larger field of value. And no longer do you have outrageous beauty, right? You always get outrageous pain. Whenever you decontextualize a value in the larger field of value, and it doesn't live in creative tension with the other values that creates a new whole, 
you create outrageous pain. And in America, this weekend, we've seen outrageous pain as Roe v. Wade, which I'll talk about in a second, right, was overturned in America. And our response, right, to outrageous pain, we live in a world of outrageous pain, the only response to outrageous pain, right, is outrageous love. What's outrageous love? So love, right, in this new story of value we're telling in this great library we're writing in this particular piece, you can take a look at a book called The Mystery of Love. There's a chapter on perception and a book called A Return to Eros. I mean, we can catch those in the chat box where there's also a chapter of perception where we unpack the qualities of Eros. And one of them is, right, perception, Eros or love as perception, which is the ability to see the whole. All right, so outrageous love means, right, to love you means I see you. I don't identify you with one part of you and then identify that as all of you and therefore dismiss you, right? I actually, that's what hate means. Hate means I see one narrow part of you. It might be a shadow part of you. I identify you with that shadow. I identify you with that scandal. I identify you with that place that you fell, that place that you yelled, that place that you were you know, enraged, that place where you, you made a mistake. And I say, that's who you are. No, I can see all of you. To be a lover is to see with God's eyes. It's to see the landscape, it's to see the, the, the thoughtscape, it's to see the mindscape, it's to see the heartscape with God's eyes and to know that it contains multitudes. Love is perception, outrageous love is outrageous perception, it's to see. And when you see, you see beauty, right? So now I wanna apply this, okay? And I wanna apply this, and this is, we're just setting the intention, but the intention is important to set today, right? Because we're gonna, we're gonna look at, for a second, just, just for a couple of minutes, just with this, you know, setting of intention. I just want to look for a, a couple of minutes at, you know, what happened in America today. And I don't want to talk about it. It happened uh, on Friday. Right? There was a constitutional right to abortion that was enacted in the United States some 50 years ago, right, by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court just overturned that constitutional right. And there's a huge divide in America. There's enormous celebration by pro-life activists. And there's enormous mourning, right, by pro-choice activists, right? And one side, right, filled with intelligent people, not evil people. I want you to get this. If you, the second you demonize the other side, we're out of beauty. We're in outrageous pain, right? Fabulous, beautiful people, right, filled with a sense of value are on one side. And fabulous, beautiful people right, filled with intelligence and a sense of value and goodness are on the other side. So what happened? So I want to really get this. This is so deep. And, and y'all, are you with me? I know this is really subtle what we're about to do. We're, we're here to kind of actually say the things you can't read in the news. We're here to go deeper. We're here to get underneath, right? So welcome, everyone. And it's so good to be with you. And thank you for, for being here. And thank you for listening. And I'm going to see if we can capture this in a few minutes. Like what's actually happening here and see if we can kind of find it deeper than deep and actually do evolutionary sense making. So in the clash between the kind of pro-life position and pro-choice position, several things are happening that need to be pointed out that are beyond important. So number one, number one, each side is claiming a value as the ultimate value. And in some sense or another, dismissing the value of the other side. So the pro-life people are saying the value is life, but particularly they mean the life of the baby. That's the primary value. And protecting the value of the life of the baby right, is the primary value. And therefore they call themselves pro-life. But actually what they're doing is they're hijacking the value of life, turning that into an absolute value and ignoring a second value, which is the value of choice. Now, the pro-choice people are doing the same thing. They're picking a value, choice. And it's the woman's right to choose. Right? That's what they're talking about, choice. And they're calling themselves pro-choice, but they're actually, in doing so, decontextualizing choice from the larger field of values, which includes life, and making choice the primary 
value, and in some sense, the only value, before which all other values much must bow. Now, again, the pro-life people are doing the same thing, right? They're decontextualizing life, in this case, the life of the baby, right? From the larger field of value, which includes the life of the mother and includes choice, and those are related, and saying their value reigns supreme. But here's the thing, and it's very beautiful, right? The word value in Hebrew is erech, E-R-E-C-H. See if we can catch it maybe in the chat box, E-R-E-C-H, E-R-E-C-H. Right? It, I would say it's not, it's choice, right? Right? Erech. Now, erech means value, and erech also means context. Context, or erech means kind of the, the, the constellation or the field, right? So the constellation or the field, okay? You guys following? You guys following here? The constellation or the field. So, Erech means value, but it also means context or constellation or field, meaning the, the value in a larger context of values or the constellation of values right, or the field of value. So the word value in Hebrew means context or constellation right, or the larger field because no value exists independently of the larger field. Whenever you isolate a value from the larger field of value, and you transpose it into an absolute value, before which all values must bow, at whose altar you worship and bend your knee slavishly, then you create idolatry, then you create outrageous pain. Did everyone catch that? It's, it's deep, it's important. So in this great argument, right, between pro-life and pro-choice, the way they've actually framed the arguments, right, is actually absurd. They've each claimed a value, Right, they've then rejected the other value and caricatured, and this is point two, they've caricatured the other's position. So in order to highlight the absurdity of the other's value. So I, I wanna go slow here for a second, okay? I wanna get to point two, I mean, it gets deeper. So, when we take a position which says, and I want to get both sides of it. And I want to actually cite two texts here. One is a Washington Post article that I read yesterday, which is the key liberal paper, one of the two key liberal papers in the United States. Right? And the second is a post number 68 by a, a colleague of mine who we've, we've actually chatted a whole bunch of times. We did a big public debate back in 2005. We we're actually about to do a second one. We had about a thousand people there. We we're about to do a second one in Los Angeles, right? His name is Dennis Prager. We, we've had dinner a couple of times. And, you know, Dennis Prager, right, right, in what he calls his fireside chats, right, does in number, I think, 64 or 68, does a chat on abortion, which is highly relevant. And Dennis is clearly articulating some version of a pro-life position, right? And the Washington Post, right, was articulating yesterday some version of a pro-choice position. Now, I wanna, I'm gonna watch this carefully, okay? So Prager, right, right, correctly, right, and wisely, at least in part, right, opens, right, his conversation with and when I say correctly and wisely, I mean not in an ultimate correct and wise sense, but I mean from a, a polemical perspective, right? For the sake of argument. He opens and he, he, this, and he, he makes this, this post, you know, probably, I don't know, a decade ago. And it was a moment in which in the United States, there were a number of bills, right? That he spoke about, which were being presented in legislators, right? So he presents, right? To actually argue that, abortion should be a woman's choice because after all, right, we need to have control over our own bodies. So abortion should be a woman's choice in the third trimester, right? The third trimester of nine months or meaning between six and nine months when, when clearly there's fetal viability. So that's what he makes the subject of his piece. And then with that context, he's now evoked that context. So he's now evoked the context and the vision, right, of a, a baby that's clearly alive in the mother. And then he then makes the second point 
And then he, from that perspective, within the last trimester, right, essentially mocks the notion that women should be responsible, right, you know, for their bodies, because he says, right, the notion that we're saying that women are responsible for their bodies is not the issue. The issue is not the body of the woman. The issue is the body of the baby. Now, in the third trimester, that's clearly true. And then he goes on to say, you know, if in fact that baby in the third trimester was born prematurely, right, and the mother killed the baby, would that be okay? Well, obviously that wouldn't be okay, right? And so then one becomes emotionally invested, right, in the pro-life position, and it seems to be patently obvious, right? And he makes the point, right, that actually it's not just about the woman's body, it's about a baby inside the woman's body, Right, which is why you know, we don't ask the woman, how's your body? We say, how's the baby doing right, during pregnancy? Right? Clearly, there's a sense of the baby right? and that we're talking about protecting the life of the baby right, in the third trimester. Now, when we're looking at an extreme bill, right, which Prager right, suggests, and I haven't researched all of these bills. Right? I'm, I'm actually citing Prager about these bills, but I haven't had actually time. I looked at it briefly this morning, but I'm going to actually ask you know, one of the research people in the gang to actually find those bills, but he's referring to, and, I, and Prager's trustworthy in that sense. He's a, he's a trustworthy source, so I, I trust him in that sense. I don't think he'd talk about bills that didn't exist, right? He's talking about this number of bills that are in legislature that are being proposed, right, that are suggesting that you actually can do abortion in the third trimester. Now, what he's doing is he's taking the position of choice, the pro-choice position, and he's showing its expression in its most extreme form, almost a caricatured form, which is absurd, right? And that bills like that were put forth, I have no doubt, right? And I believe that those bills are on the face of it, other than in extreme circumstances, absurd, as does virtually everyone, because everyone agrees that if there's full fetal viability and we're, you know, in six or seven months, Right? The notion of an abortion right, takes on an entirely different issue. It's not just about the woman's body, right? it's about the baby. Okay, that's clear. But what has Prager done? Right? He's caricatured the choice position and made choice into an independent value that stands by itself right? and then showed it right, to lead to outrageous pain. Now, again, when I say Prager's done it, it's not actually Prager who did it. It's actually the bills that were introduced right, on the pro-choice side that argued for this radical notion of choice being the exclusive value. Right? And therefore, that would allow, and this set of bills introduced you know, a decade back, that would allow, I'll have to check the exact dates, right, that would allow right, for right, women's choice in the third trimester. That's a caricature of choice, right, both in those who articulated those bills but Prager intentionally picks up on that, right, in order to characterize the pro-choice position, right? That is a distortion of an extreme kind on Prager's side. Here's the other side, Washington Post. Washington Post is reporting on the overturning of Roe v. Wade, right, and a number of other outlets, you know, major outlets did the same thing that the Post did, and they interview any number of people and any number of abortion clinics that are immediately shutting their door and refusing, right, based on, you know, how they understand the law. And that is indeed in certain places, there are trigger laws in states, in certain states that are trigger laws that are in place that says that right after Roe v. Wade is passed, then state laws are passed on abortion. And some of those state laws, Oklahoma, for example, will prohibit abortion immediately. Right. Meaning, right. As soon as there's fertilization, abortion should be immediately prohibited. Now, let's go slow. That position that abortion should be immediately prohibited as soon as there's fertilization. Right. Is an extremist pro-life position, just like the position that would allow choice in the third trimester is an extremist pro-choice position, right? In other words, a position that would say that we ignore the body of the woman and we ignore woman's choice, right? Let's say in some dimension of the first trimester, let's not talk now about what that dimension should be, 
right, is actually a fundamentalist position of the worst kind that actually denies, let's, let's, let's go really clear here, it actually denies the depth and the wisdom of most of the great traditions, right? For example, there are important, right, Upanishads in the great Hindu tradition, right, that talk about the soul entering the baby much, much later. There's actually even Upanishads that talk about the soul, right, entering the baby at least at the end of the second trimester. That's dramatic, but let's not get that dramatic. There are major sources in the Judeo-Christian tradition, and particularly in the Talmud, right, that actually argue for the possibility of abortion in any number of quite a wide range of possibilities, right, within at least a certain dimension, right, of the first trimester. Now, I, in the period of time in life in which I functioned formally, right, as an Orthodox rabbi, right, within the Orthodox Hebrew wisdom tradition, right, in accordance with the laws of the Talmud, right, I was in touch with the leading decisors of the day, the great sainted sages with the long white beards who were experts in decision-making of the day, including Moses Feinstein, right? Called Rav Moshe Feinstein, one of the greatest sainted decisors of the day. And we allowed abortions, right? Uh, you know, allowed meaning, you know, we, we decided the law, right? We adjudicated the law. Right, not, you know, in other words, and right, many, many women are involved in adjudicating this law, right? It's about the law, it's not about we the people, right? The law was adjudicated in favor of abortion, right, within right, a certain dimension of the first trimester, within orthodoxy. Right? I mean, it's within the most stringent form of the interpretation of Hebrew law. Right. So point being, point being, right, when the fetus right steps into being a person who is in some sense independent and needs to be considered as a person, that's a very real question. And at, actually, there's no monopoly on that. Actually, the great traditions of spirit had an enormous range of conversations about that. And when we integrate the best of pre-modern, modern, and post-modern in order to create a new story of value, we have to integrate and actually the best wisdom of the great traditions that actually had a very sophisticated position on abortion that actually allowed and integrated two values, right? One value is choice and the woman's health and the woman's wholeness and the woman's well-being and the woman's possibility, right, for expression in the world. Another value, right, articulated protection of the baby and the life of the baby and clearly those are both values. And those are both critical values. And the second we step out of the field of value, right? And th this is critical, right? The second, the second we step out of the field of value, there's no possibility right, of actually coming to a higher synergy, to higher beauty. And to be clear, these decisions need to be made by the depth of understanding, not by men or women not by patriarchies or matriarchies, but by men and women working together, particularly within, you know, Hebrew wisdom. You know, I've long argued right, when I was in that world, I'm not, I'm now functioning in a more universal world, but when I was in that world, I long argued that women, right, who are expert in law and tradition, right, and in compassion and love, right, in this particular field should be the ones who are adjudicating the decisions on abortion, right? There are many, many women who are brilliant experts, right, at the text and at the medical issues, right, and at the, at the embodied experience level, right? And clearly we're in a generation where we shouldn't have men deciding these issues for women, right? We should have within each tradition, great women, right, who are actually involved in adjudicating these decisions, who actually experience these realities in their body, right? We're, we're at a new moment in time. So, you know, although patriarchy is a complex word and it's overused and misused, right, it also has some legitimacy, right, and some importance. And so let's take out, or let's take patriarchies out of this conversation, okay? So let's find this. Let's find this, friends. This is a big deal. In order to actually engage this conversation, we can't caricature on either side. We can't do the Washington Post caricature, right, which says, right, that actually the intention of right, all legislation, right, on abortion, right, is, right, to actually disallow, right, abortion at the moment of fertilization, 
right? That's actually not the case, right? Nor should it be the case, although, but now stay, although the Washington Post is absolutely right that there are states that have articulated trigger state laws, right, in which a law is going to be triggered 30 days after Roe Wade is overturned. They've been on the books for many years. And some of them, right, and I've got to check each one of them, but at least one of them I know right now, it actually triggers a law which makes abortion immediately illegal. So we'll have to look, right? I haven't had time to research all of the detailed legal issues, right? But clearly there are serious voices in the pro-life camp that want to do, right, what the Washington Post is claiming. And that would be a complete fundamentalist move, right, which idolizes, it's idolatry. It's the idolatry of one value, which is the idolatry of the pro-life vision, which says, right, we have to protect the life of the baby, which they argue gratuitously against the great traditions of most of the religions. As they argue gratuitously against the great traditions of most of the religions, begins at fertilization. That's extremism. Extremism, extremism means you pick one value, you decontextualize your value from the larger field of value, and then you say you can never have enough of your value. Does everyone get that? That's not outrageous beauty. Outrageous beauty incorporates and integrates contradicting values, right? Contradicting values, right? In any state, and there are real laws, right? In real states right now that are claiming that position, which is a complete violation of spirit. I want to say that really clearly. There are real states and real laws that are making that claim right now. Not, not the entire pro-life right movement, but there are clear, powerful expressions of it happening right now, and that is idolatry. I just want to say it clearly, that's idolatry. That's the taking of one value. It's an extremist fundamentalist position. It's the decontextualization of that value from the field of value and the propping it up um, as an absolute before which we must all bow. So that's one right extremist position on the pro-life side. But then you have, right, on the pro-choice side, you have a and it's part of what's fostered this, not all of what's fostered it, it's been fostered by both sides, but part of what's fostered it is the kind of bills that Prager described, right? Which argued for, right, a choice possibility, even in the third trimester, which shocked, which shocked, which sent ripple waves of shock, right, through the pro-life community and created a counter reaction. So here's the thing, right? The demonization of either side which is the demonization of the other's value, or more specifically, the transformation of my value into an absolute, before which all other values must, must bow, right? that is outrageous pain. Outrageous pain can only be responded to through outrageous love. Outrageous love, love is a perception. Love is knowledge. Love is gnosis. Martha Nussbaum correctly titled one of her books, Love's Knowledge, right? Love allows me to see, love allows me to know. And love allows me to perceive beauty. And beauty, both as the Hebrew wisdom and interior sciences articulated it, and, right, as Whitehead correctly articulated it, beauty contains multitudes. Beauty contains contradictory values, right? And from that contradiction, paradox emerges and new synergy and new beauty arises. Now, I want to go deeper. and Let's see if we can. Can we go deeper one step? Who's up for going deeper? I want to go deeper one step. One step deeper. Who's up for one step? I want to go deeper. We got to go deeper one step. I mean, it, and and it, 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 it's wild and it's important and it's critical. Can we go one step deeper? Who's up for one step deeper? Okay. One step deeper. And this is so subtle and, and it's beautiful and it's important. But it, it's not easy to get. Okay. It's not easy to get. So let's go. Let's go step at a time. But let's go deeper for a second. Paradoxically, both the pro-life right, and the pro-choice position, I believe in their own interior, have stepped out of what I would call the field of value. And I want to explain what that means. Okay, let's we're, we're all the way on the deep end now, okay? Let's explain what that means. So one. And it's going to be paradoxical and surprising on both sides. The position of much of the left, which is expressing the pro-choice position, is deeply entrenched in the postmodern matrix. And the postmodern matrix deconstructs value. 
Right? Value doesn't actually exist. You're not in a field of value. But no one can live without value. So once you step out of the field of value, what you do is you then choose one value and you make that value not a value in the field, but your identity. That value actually becomes your identity. That value becomes your absolute, right? That value becomes a kind of puritanism, right? That value becomes your crusade because that value is no longer a value in the field of value. That value becomes you entirely your identity and any compromise on that value is a compromise on your very existence. Therefore, you become a rabid extremist, right? You become angry. You can't have a real conversation. You can't engage in facts because your identity is that value and that value is decontextualized from the field of value. And therefore that value brings outrageous pain. And there's no outrageous love to respond to it that will bring us to outrageous beauty. Now on the other side, let's get the other side. Let's get the other side. On the other side, and it's deep. The other side, you would think, well, but the pro-life people, they're in the field of value. No, they're not. The pro-life people have actually regressed, right? Most of the pro-life position, right, is animated and funded by either fundamentalist versions of Christianity or particular Catholic versions of Christianity, which are actually, and let's catch this, which are actually in their, their core belief systems pre-modern. And in pre-modernity, it wasn't a field of universal value with multiple values in the field. It was a field of value that was hijacked and colonized by one set of, in this case, often patriarchal interpreters. And here I will use the word patriarchy, although I often don't use it because it's overused and misused, as my friend Warren Farrell has pointed out. But here I will use it. Right? In other words, men right, who were not living in women's bodies, who were deeply sensitive to women in many ways, some of them, and some of them were definitely not. There was also a particular position on the role of women in society and in most of Christendom. And that came together with legitimate life considerations of the baby and formulated right, a set of laws right, of a particular extreme fundamentalist nature, both in Catholicism right, and in the sources of many of the fundamentalist Christ traditions that are happening in America, right, in their in their more kind of Baptist or fundamentalist forms. So what's happening now is much of the pro-life movement is animated not by the field of value, but actually by a pre-modern position that's paradoxically not in the field of value. How do you know the pre-modern positions were not in the field of value? Because they actually claimed that only their position was value and that all the other competing religious positions were not only wrong, but the competing religions deserve to be killed as either infidels right, or heretics, burned at the stake, tortured by the Inquisition. Let's get this really clear. That's not a position in the field of value. So the pro-life movement is informed. Does everyone get that? The pro-life movement is informed not by the field of value. Right? The pro-life movement is informed actually by being out of the field of value They've stepped out of the field of value. They've caricatured the field of value and hijacked it. So therefore, now their identity, right, is bound up with their parochial, self-aggrandizing, essentially narcissistic position, right? It's us and it's no one else. And therefore, it can't consider other very substantive, saintly, religious positions on this issue of abortion that take fundamental issue with any of the extreme expressions of it, for example, for example, right, no allowing of abortion during at least some segment of the first trimester, which is absurd, which is utterly absurd. And to be clear, I myself have legislated abortion cases, right, with women, right, who are experts in the law, right, together, right, when I say legislated, wrong idea, wrong word, adjudicated, right, in which I encouraged the woman in those conditions to get an abortion Right, together with her husband, because it would have actually destroyed her life. And did I think I was destroying a baby's life? Absolutely not. There's very, very saintly, reasoned, stunning positions of some of the deepest 
hearts and minds, right, looking at the law, right, in the Talmud, right, that supported that ruling. All of that has been thrown out by the pro-life expressions in their extreme forms, which are decontextualizing one value from the field of value in a pre-modern way in which only their interpretation of that value right, is considered in any way legitimate. Wow. Wow. Right? Does everyone begin to see it? Right? In other words, you begin to see what we mean when we say that in order to evolve the source code of consciousness and culture, in order to move beyond polarization, we have to actually tell a new story of value, which is a story of outrageous beauty. And outrageous beauty means that we've actually articulated a story of value rooted in first principles and first values, in which choice and life are obviously, right, both first principles and first values, out of which synergy emerges, which generates right, a response to outrageous pain through outrageous love, which is outrageous beauty. Now, remember, remember, and this is really, really important, when you step out of the field of value and you choose one value as your idolatry or as your identity before which you kneel and which you can't compromise on, and idolatry before which you kneel, your identity on which you can't compromise on, you create outrageous pain and you create polarization. You create polarization because you've stepped out of the field of value. And so the two values clash with each other and each side thinks they're representing value. They're not, they're representing narcissistic identity or idolatry, right? Do you get that? Now, now let's go one last step. Yeah, everyone gets to get this, what, literally one last step. We together one last step, everybody. One last step, and it's really beautiful. If both sides step into the field of value, then they share the field of value together. And I wanna, I wanna get this really clearly. And this is a big deal, right? And it's, this is a whole new notion. So imagine you step into your true identity. What's our true identity? So we know as, op, as Albert Einstein correctly pointed out, right, that separation is an optical delusion of consciousness. The notion I'm a separate self is an optical delusion of consciousness, it's not true. There is no ultimate separate self. Separate self is real, of course, but right? I should experience myself as an individuated separate self with appropriate boundaries. That's of course real, but that's not my deeper identity. My deeper identity is that my separate self is located in a larger field, right? And I don't exist, for example, without certain microbes right at the bottom of the sea. I actually have no life without them. I have no life without the coral reefs. I have no life without the larger field of the biosphere. I have no life without the larger field of consciousness. My consciousness is not a separate consciousness. I'm living in the field right, of love intelligence and love beauty and love desire and love consciousness. And we call that true self, okay? Now, true self in that field. So in that field of true self, is there any difference between Mark and Elena or Shahat or Mark and Larry? None. Right? We're all the same in true self. And within the field of true self, there's one true self. The total number of true selves in the world is one. True self is the singular that has no plural. It's the seamless code of the universe. It's the one heart. It's the one eros. It's the one consciousness that animates the four forces. Right? That is, as systems theory points towards in its deeper expressions, not in its surface expressions, Right, is kind of the one cosmos, if you will. That's why it's a uni-verse, uni-verse. It's one text. That's true self. Now, true self, and this is subtle, it's beautiful. True self is the same as the field of value. Value is true self. Value is consciousness. Consciousness is value, right? Right. And it's, value is everywhere. You know, a, a lot of times today we talk about post-Claude Shannon, we talk about information. But, you know, and Claude Shannon is one of the fathers of information theory. But Claude Shannon actually wrote a paper with Warren Weaver where he pointed out that what information is at its core is not bits and bytes, which is how it was used in information theory. But actually, as Weaver, Warren Weaver writes with Shannon, like 1948, actually information at its core is meaning or value. Right? In other words, when three quarks, right, associate with each other, two down quarks and one up quark, right, two up quarks and one down quark, one's a proton, the other's a neutron, and that which brings them together to create a proton and neutron, that's value, 
right? There's values that exist from the first nanoseconds of the Big Bang when gazillions of quarks reign, and there's only 16 kind of particular configurations of value which create 16 forms of quarks, right? I mean, it's wild, right? The universe is not random in any sense, shape, or form. The universe, right, is has a dimension of spontaneity and contingency and freedom, and in its core, that's in the context of enormous beauty in which opposite synergizes in fields of value and configurations of intimate coherence. So the field of value is like the field of true self. And this is, and I may have lost a couple of people here because I know it, it's a deep dive. See if we can, we can get, get it. True self is the single that has no plural. It's the field of one consciousness. Consciousness is the same as value. Consciousness and value are inextricably entwined with each other. So just like there's a field of consciousness in which we're all we're all part of the same true self. There's no distinction between Mark and Shot or Mark and Elena in that field of one consciousness, right? That field of one value. So the second we all step into the field of value, we recognize each other in the field of value. We're part of the same true value. We're part of the same true self. Now stay close. Then Elena individuates. Then Ben individuates, right? Then James individuates. I individuate as unique self. Does everyone get that? Colleen. Colleen individuates as unique self. Does everyone get that? Now there's Colleen. Colleen is a beautiful artist, right? You know, in Europe, right? Doing gorgeous work and has done 12 beautiful paintings, right? On Eros. So true self individuates as Colleen. That's unique self. So the same way that true self individuates as Colleen as unique self, the field of value, true value, individuates as choice individuates as life, individuates as any one of the larger field of values. Does everyone get that? Who gets that? Who gets that? In other words, a unique value is the same as unique self. It's beautiful, right? It's just like true self individuates as Jacqueline or as Colleen or as Elena or as Mark or as Sally. So true value individuates as a unique value. Does everyone get that? Now, and it's beautiful. Now, true self is not the same as unique self. Unique self is the individuation of true self. But stay really close now. Stay really, really close. But unique self is not the same as separate self. Unique self is not the same as separate self. Separate selves are in what Hobbes called a state of war. There's a natural state of war between the separate selves. And if I would try and summarize, I've dabbled in great Russian literature over the last 20 years. Elena, you know it better than I do, but I've dabbled in it. And one of the things that Russian literature, had, when, it, when it's truly trying to stand for moral clarity, is gra grappling with, right? How do we actually create peace between separate selves with their own, each one with their own, you know, rich inner texture? And how do you create a larger field of value? And it's very hard to do, right? Because, you know, a lot of the great Russian literature, right, right, was written either under the influence of early Christianity or modern modernity that was already anticipating post-modernity, right? Bracket those two sentences if you miss them. But here's the important point. Stay close. Unique self is not the same as separate self. I can only create harmony between unique selves if unique self understands that I'm an expression of true self. Does everyone get that? If I'm an expression of true self, so then we're all true selves. We're all together in the field of consciousness. We're all brothers and sisters, right, in the one love and the one heart of cosmos, and then we're uniquely individuated. Then we can create synergy. Then we can create beauty. Then we, we can create outrageous beauty. But, right, if we're separate selves, then what Hobbes calls in Leviathan, or in his earlier book, Man and Citizen, right, the natural state of war, right, which is nasty, brutish, and short, as our lives so often are, actually reigns. Wow. And actually, as Leo Strauss pointed out, even, you know, Locke, John Locke was really Hobbes with a velvet glove, and the separate self is the core of Western society. Now stay with me. The same thing's true of that value. In other words, if I never enter the field of value, the field of true value, the field of true self, as it were, if I'm not in the field of value, then the value that I choose will be not my unique self value. It won't be a unique value, right? Which is the same as unique self in which those unique values that emerge from the field of value can synergize. It will rather be a separate value, just like separate self. 
It'll be a separate value. And because it's a separate value, those two values will clash. They have to clash because it's a separate self value, right? It's a separate value in the same sense of separate self. So now they've got to, they've got to clash. They've got to clash with each other. They can't actually find each other because it becomes identity. Just like in the realm of self, separate self becomes identity. It becomes an ego identity, which I have to defend at any cost. So too, the separate value becomes my identity, which I have to defend at any cost. And paradoxically, both the pro-life and the pro-choice movement and the ways we've outlined today have stepped out of that field of value. So they don't recognize each other. They don't find each other in the field of one value. If we found each other and experienced each other in the field of one value, then we'd be able to synergize and we wouldn't come to this day of outrageous pain in America. This is deep, friends. This is deep. This is what we mean by a source code evolution. Now, did anyone, right? That's exactly correct. There's no intimacy between values. Intimacy between values only takes place, right? And intimacy between values allows for, what is intimacy? Intimacy is shared identity in the context of otherness. That's the intimacy formula. So when you have intimacy between values, you can create a shared identity between two opposing values in the context of otherness where the integrity of each value is honored. That's huge. So actually this entire conversation, right, could be understood in terms of the tenets of intimacy. Intimacy equals shared identity in the context of otherness. You apply that intimacy formula to, to values and you have our whole conversation today. And Jamie, we should put this in tenets of intimacy. Right? Wild, right? Now you begin to see what the center is doing. Right? This is what we're doing together. This is what we're doing as Unique Self Symphony. We're actually articulating a new story of value because right now there is no story of value. The superstructure has broken down. And we need, right, what my friend Daniel calls a third attractor. Right, right. I call it the new strange detractor. We need a new, I call it right in, in other writings, a new allurement. Right. We say that a complex system is based on allurement, and a complex system in which the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, and a complicated system which is fragile has no allurement. And I shared that distinction with my brother Daniel about five, six years ago. That the core, right, to actually generating right a new story of value right, is actually recognizing and articulating a vision of value which is intrinsic to cosmos and evolves. It's evolving value, but there's intrinsic values. Once we have evolving values that are intrinsic, then we're in a field of allurement, right, because value allures, right? The nature of values that value allures. Value is, and this is really important, and we'll finish with this, value is eros. Eros is value and value is eros, right? And so eros generates allurement. When you're not in the field of value, there's no allurement. So what happens is you manage to find the position of your adversary, not alluring, even ugly. And you caricature it as being ugly. You caricature the pro-choice position in an ugly way. And you caricature the pro-life position in an ugly way. But when you step into the field of value, you're in the field of Eros. You're in the Tao. When you're in the Tao, then all values have a place in the Tao and they're beautiful. Now you're moving towards outrageous beauty. Whitman's I contain multitudes or Whitehead's notion of beauty that contains more and more and more contradiction in which the contradiction becomes, and let me add something critical to our Eros theory, to our cosmorotic humanism. And cosmorotic humanism, for those of you who are new, is the overarching story of value that we're working on at the center that everything's a part of. Unique self theory, they're all part of Cosmorotic humanism, right? In this basic notion, right, of cosmoerotic humanism. Let me let me see if I can get this. Hold on. We articulate, right, a vision of beauty which allows contradiction not to turn into polarization, but to turn into paradox, right? When you're in the field of value, which is the field of eros, which is the field of beauty, then contradiction becomes not polarization, but paradox. And the Garden of Eden is not paradise, right? The Garden of Eden is paradox. And from that paradox, we can love each other. Because love always 
holds paradox. And paradox is uncertainty. And from that place of epistemic humility and uncertainty, we can create new synergies, new beauties that are unimaginable.